two years ago when I, um, when my team and I at Princeton University finished second in the contest, it was very much about statistical standards and, uh, and that was, uh, I think, very much about that kind of quantitative analysis. This year, the contest, if I understand correctly, was about legal theories. And so we had to extend ourselves, and let me just talk about that a little bit. Uh, I think if you follow this kind of case well, you know that in the last high-profile partisan gerrymandering case in front of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice John Roberts is not a big lover of technology or of mathematics. And uh, during oral argument, I was there in the room when he did this, he expostulated with the word, the phrase sociological gobbledygook, which made my heart as a nerd fall. And so I'm thinking, I don't know, it's math and statistics was the big deal. Uh, but, and, and I didn't say anything. Uh, it was, of course, out of my place as a scientist to say that legal terminology and legal arguments also have a certain uh, air to them. <laughs> but they're the ones with the power, and they're the ones who are decision makers. And so we interpreted as our brief in the contest, how could we apply our quantitative skills to things that would make sense to a lawyer and to well-established ideas that are important in a legal context. And we really had to channel that. And during the question period over there in the other room, I got really interested in the panel's views about federalism. And what we did here in this contest was we really channeled our inner federalist. And we asked the question, all the hard work that social scientists have done, uh, there are several you see before you on this panel, uh, and others who have been involved in this space, all that hard work that math people, that computer science people have done, could it be applied to state-by-state -state arguments? Could we channel our inner federalist and find a way to look to turn the concept of states' rights on its head and say, okay, all this math has been done, just add water. In this case, the water is state law. And the water in, the, in this place where we are now is the North Carolina state constitution. And so what I want to do is go over exactly how we did that. Now here on the slide are just a few paragraphs I picked um, from these really beautifully written decisions in the Gill versus Whitford uh, uh, case last year uh, concerning Wisconsin's state assembly districts. I should say that if we can get our, our emotions away from what's going on with these cases, I found these decisions a pleasure to read. I found that John Roberts did a really wonderful job of writing about standing, writing about how individual voters are harmed, and how if one were so inclined, one could think about individual voters of a party being harmed the way that individual members of an ethnic group or racial group could be harmed. And so I thought that was just really beautifully written, and, and, and as a beginning student of con law, constitutional law, I really enjoyed it a lot. And I would pose it to you today as a question of unequal voter power, and that's uh, something that sometimes gets called one person, one vote. It's under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. Now in her concurrence, this is a funny thing, because it's a four-vote concurrence, everyone was playing to Anthony Kennedy in this. Everybody was aimed at him. And then they did this, and then he retired, but yeah, aside from um, So Justice Kagan got very interested in statewide harms, and she went on uh, at some length about the kind of burden to a, a group of voters' representational rights uh, that Justice Kennedy wrote about in, the, I believe, the Beef versus Jubilee decision. And so the idea here is that you can be harmed on account of your viewpoint. If you're in Greensboro, you can be harmed if voters in Greenville are harmed by being split down the middle of that city. That's the kind of harm that happens if you belong to a group. And so really, this is, uh, Justice Kennedy would phrase it as a First Amendment violation under viewpoint discrimination. And these are things that are contained in the federal constitution, and, and many people's hopes ride on do, using the federal constitution to hive off extreme gerrymanders at a national level. But what we did in our contest entry, we, we, I'll be really frank and say that we didn't do new math. What we did was we, did, we took the existing map that people have done, worked on. Uh, Someone has played a pretty key role here in the current case by the chair of your math department here locally. Uh, and there are people here who know a lot about these things. What we did is we tried to create some kind of simple framework that would take all those things that Tom Wolf on the panel just a few minutes ago, he said, it's like a 42 hammers that you encounter in the store. We said, OK, you know what? There's a bunch of tools on the shelf, hammers, screwdrivers, what have you. Let's just sort them into categories and point out to the, to the court whether it be the Supreme Court or a state Supreme Court, that the details of the math may not matter that much. What really matters is the concept that you care about, whether it be viewpoint discrimination or unequal voter power or other concepts that may arise in state constitutions. And that's what I really want to tell you about today. OK, so here's the framework that we have here. So the legal concepts that we organize things into, and I, and I will make the major disclaimer that I'm not a lawyer, and so these things might move around a little bit once we have a good discussion with uh, some of the experts who are here at this conference. Um, we basically wanted to take these quantitative tests and turn them into a Swiss Army knife 
for diagnosing gerrymanders. And we said some measures are measures of inequality of opportunity, where individual voters get hurt in their ability to elect someone of their choice. Just as if you're a member of a racial group and you get stuck in a district where, where, where it's 80% your group, that sounds pretty good, but you've lost opportunities to elect members in districts next door to you. Or maybe you live in a town, and I believe it's Greenville, it's one of the cities in North Carolina that got split. You live there, and you got split, so your community's all there, but half of your community's in one district, half's in another, you don't have an opportunity to elect anyone. And that's an example of inequality of opportunity. And so when we think about things like examining alternative maps and examining what happens to individual voters, uh, I, uh, uh, Professor Mattingly can... Uh, to, I've actually lost track of all the experts in this room, to be totally honest, and so I'm just gonna not assign too much credit for, for, for everybody. I just, we're always being around so many fellow nerds. Anyway. Uh, I'm standing behind you. Yes, good. So I said, I'll look at you. All right. Um, and, and furthermore, I think there's going to be some really good stuff that's said later uh, by the next two uh, speakers. Anyway, look, let me just uh, stick to the legal theory. Um, inequality of opportunity, where if your side won really big wins and you were packed into a few districts, your wins are lopsided in a bad way. If the average and the median vote are different, that means that a lot of districts in your state are above average. It's the Garrison-Keeler principle. <coughs> Everybody's above average. <laughs> Crazy, but true. And we have an expert on that domain who's uh, here in front of us. Um, and so these are examples of unequal opportunity that you can look at by examining the size of the win, uh, comparing the size of the win to the other side, the distribution wins, or examining alternative maps. And those are unequal opportunity. Another kind of uh, harm from a legal point of view is inequality of outcome, where there was something that happened where your side was deprived representation. On account of your viewpoint, you were deprived the opportunity to uh, elect members uh, that represent you. And racial gerrymandering is a well-established domain of law where this is a concept that's been around for a while. And at some level, the efficiency gap, without getting into any of the math nerdery, the efficiency gap see, oh, okay, is um, a measure of whether you've got a commensurate number of wins compared with the, the vote share that you've got. And so it's a measure of outcomes. And likewise, one can again look at alternative maps to, uh, to again analyze the number of all, overall wins. Um, there are other measures, and I, did, I wanted to keep this slide simple, so I didn't really want to get into it too much. And I also hope that we would get into more of a discussion later on with the whole panel. But these are just a sampling of some of the tests that one can apply to look for inequality of opportunity and inequality of uh, outcomes. Now, some of these to take the math, some of these tests actually go quite a long ways. And in fact, comparing one side's average wins to the other side's average wins is just asking the question, are two averages different from one another? It turns out that that goes back over a century. It goes back to this fellow, his name is William Seeley Gossett. He wrote under the pseudonym of student. And if you've ever taken a statistics course, you may know about student's t-test. It's because his bosses at the Guinness Brewing Company did not want him giving away secrets to the other lesser beer companies. And so he devised this test called Student's T-Test, and he used it for things like asking whether a batch of hops was different from what he was expecting, that kind of thing. So it was beer quality control that led him to develop the Student T-Test. And it turns out that compared to averages is one of the tests that we proposed uh, some years ago. Uh, we proposed it to the Supreme Court in the Gill case, and I also wrote about it in a Stanford Law Review article, which I invite you to look up. It's available online. You don't have to pay for it. Um, and so you can look up uh, our way of trying to fit Mr. Gossett's test into uh, a framework. Now, these statistical tests we've collected at gerrymander.princeton.edu. I invite you to come look at that, too. That's on your handheld right now. Uh, wait until after everyone's spoken. You're supposed to be. I'm a teacher, so you can. <laughs> Afterward. Um, but you can see here in 2012, there's some of the usual suspects, right? We hear about them a lot. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, Virginia, North Carolina. And the happy news is that many of these states have had their gerrymanders undone in one way or another. And of course, one of the remaining battlegrounds is North Carolina, which is why we're having such an interesting conference today and tomorrow. And so these are just examples of simple statistical measures of the type that I've been talking about, where we just applied them to all the states in the union, and you can just look it up and, and browse the depredations yourself at your leisure. Okay, so now let's talk about North Carolina very briefly without getting into it too much because uh, I actually have a little bit more to say after this. Um, you can see here that it's easy to see uh, the averages here. The average Democratic win in the last election was 72%. The average Republican win is around, uh, around 54%. Uh, so much to say about the 9th district, but we don't know which side is going to win, but it wouldn't really change the averages 
very much. Uh, but the idea here is that just comparing these averages allows you to see at a glance that there's something pretty serious that happened uh, simply by looking at these election statistics. And so you can see that the averages are different. That would be an example of inequality of opportunity. You can see that the number of seats is out of whack with the average vote share, where the vote was almost equally split, and yet one side got nine and the other side got three seats. That's an example of inequality of outcome. And so these are simple measures that one can apply. All of this is to say uh, that these are ideas uh, they have been around for a while. Uh, it, it's remarkable how much religion politicians get when they leave office. After leaving office, President Teddy Roosevelt said that if the minority is as powerful as the majority, there's no use of having political contests at all, or there's no use in having a majority. And so many of us in this space are working towards this kind of outcome of trying to come up with more equitable results. Now, let me now take this in the remaining seven minutes and apply this to uh, the individual states. This is what we care about. This is uh, our actions here. We're translating math into law. And I already told you about these standards. My team has read all the state constitutions. And I will say that some of them are kind of long. I really, if you ever have time, I don't read the Alabama state constitution. <laughs> Take my word. Rick Ober and Ben Williams on my staff have read all 50 of these constitutions. And specifically, Rick Ober has done the most work. 50 constitutions out of 50 protect freedom of speech. 47 out of 50 protect association, so viewpoint discrimination falls under that. 24 states have equal protection provisions, and free and equal elections are also mentioned in 28 states. And all of these appear in the North Carolina state constitution. So it's our view, as math nerds, that we've now provided a toolbox that we hope litigators and advocates will apply at a state-by-state -state level. And I think that all the hard work of quantitative analysts, uh, of the many people in this room who, uh, who've done quantitative work, our hope is that that will provide some kind of framework where all of our efforts can slot into, into a way that seems a little bit less goblin and creepy. Now, I just want to show you uh, the kind of thing that's necessary in the future. Um, I'm going to stop in a moment, but, uh, but we want to use these standards to help citizens talk back. That involves helping citizens use software to predict partisanship and to analyze partisanship. And we're now working with uh, people who deal in uh, open redistricting software, such as Dave's redistricting app, uh, to try to make these things available. And one of the difficulties is coming up with ways to put these tools into citizens' hands. If any of you has ever used this New York Times feature, this is supposed to help you show how partisan your little precinct is. I have bad news for you. This map is really super inaccurate. It's got problems throughout it. And it turns out, yeah, it's bad, actually. So it turns out that here's Manassas Park, Virginia. You can see parts here. These are supposed to be the, the precinct boundaries of Manassas Park. See those little white wedges? If you're in one of those white wedges, this database thinks you're not in a precinct at all. If there's like a little shaded region, the, the database thinks that you're in two precincts at the same time. So the problem, so we've gone to the effort of gathering maps. We, somebody on my team went to Manassas Park, Virginia, got this paper map, scanned it in, and I think you can see at a glance that these two maps do not look similar to each other. These boundaries are not in the same place. And so we've gathered the entire state of Virginia, uh, we've now uh, put it into an openly available database. We're about to unveil that pretty soon. It's a project that we're calling Open Precincts, and we're hoping to team up with other people who are working at uh, gathering data in this space to create an open resource for anybody to use the data, not just researchers, but maybe citizens to help citizens talk back. And so it's our view that, uh, that the data that's available right now is uh, not terribly accurate. We're hoping to change that, and we've started to do that in Virginia. And this is now uh, an open precincts project in the Bethune Hill case, which is a racial gerrymandering case. Uh, and we can see the boundaries, we can see the gerrymander, we ourselves proposed a, a reform map. The general idea here is to use this kind of data, and this is our demonstration project to show that it's possible for citizens to get involved in the process. And I'm actually hoping while I'm here in North Carolina to talk about data sharing to make this go forward in the state of North Carolina as well. This is, uh, I'm very excited about North Carolina because it's such an important state in this battle. Okay, so um, so I've now kind of gotten off the topic of our contest entry, but I just want to say that uh, in the coming months, I'm hoping that, uh, to, that we'll be unveiling a demonstration project to help take the tools that we've applied, we've developed, and put them in everybody's hands. And so our goal is not just to take things to the state level, but also to put it in uh, citizen hands, put it in your hands. And so I'll stop there, and I'll thank Duke, and I thank Common Cause for, uh, for making this all possible. Thank you, Sam, very much. So I think what we'll do, in, in the interest of trying to make this more conversational, we'll save all the questions for the end so that everyone can talk about the questions. And uh, open it up yet. Next, we have Michael McDonald from 
Binghamton University and uh, second place entry. So I'm Michael McDonald. I work with a team at Binghamton and we've been on this for four or five years and uh, I've come to speak at these conferences three out of the four times they've been held, I believe. <clears throat> and I, each time I want to pitch the idea of coming up with uh, a standard, but not necessarily a legal standard, but a standard that would have a good deal of appeal, I hope, to uh, folks at Common Cause who are pushing commissions. So what's a commissioner going to do, or is a commission going to do, to determine whether it, a map that has been proposed is actually a fair map? It's not just that we need legal standards for the Supreme Court. Let's say the Supreme Court says partisan gerrymandering is unconstitutional, and either state legislatures or commissions are going to have to make this determination. So. What I'm going to present today is an idea of how we might move forward in a easily with an easily manageable standard of how to make this work. So here's a start. Here's a starting point. Easy to read, I think, and it's in line with Ellison's notion of gerrymandering and its harm. And the notion is that the harm is vote dilution. And this comes from a Supreme Court case, and it's a quote from Justice Scalia: "The practice of dividing a geographical area into electoral districts, often or highly often, but not always." A highly irregular shape to give a political party an unfair advantage by <coughs> diluting the opposition's voting strength. So I'm going to focus on the vote dilution effects. And I want to highlight that vote dilution actually comes in two forms. And here is a sort of novel legal argument. Uh, Everybody that I'm aware of and that I talk to seems to focus on vote dilution as a matter of diluting people's representational rights. And I think that's true. <coughs> but as uh, Justice White wrote, for the majority, so the Supreme Court endorsed this idea in the Vandemer case, fair and effective representation following from Reynolds is grounded in two preferences. One is for a level of parity between votes and representation sufficient to ensure that significant minority, minority voices are heard and that majorities are not consigned to minority status. Those are two different kinds of harms. One's exclusionary and one's entrenchment harm. An entrenched majority, the second harm, and an excluded minority, the first harm. So I want uh, so exclusionary gerrymanders dilute individual representational rights because they foreclose the ability to elect candidates of choice, much of what Sam was talking about, I believe. And he included as well uh, entrenchment gerrymanders that dilute individual representational rights by skewing as he just showed with the North Carolina data, uh, partisan representation. But in addition, entrenchment gerrymanders, as in North Carolina and Pennsylvania and elsewhere, dilute votes by directly using the district lines to create unequal vote weights. Because if you cast a majority of the vote and you do not win a majority of the seats, somehow, the voting majority people's votes didn't count as heavily as the minority people's votes. We just know that as a mathematical fact that doesn't involve any government vote. It's just the way it has to be. Uh, so, how do we observe these things if we're commissioners or legislatures or courts? Uh, exclusionary gerrymanders are 
necessarily require that you homogenize the, the vote percentages across the districts. You take a 45, 55, 65, three deep seat district, and you turn it into 55, 55, 55, and you exclude any minority voices. Entrenchment gerrymanders happen through a different mechanism, and that's, as I said earlier, by skewing the votes, uh, and they violate majority rule because you concentrate large numbers of one party supporters in a small number of districts, and so you go from 45, 55, 65, same fairness you started with, but you turn that majority, the group that has 55 and 65 in a fairly drawn scheme, into a 40, 45, 80, and with 55% of the vote, you get one of three seats. That's an entrenchment form of gerrymandering. Uh, I'm going to skip over the necessary conditions, but we, we could actually reason through these. Uh, much in the way that Allison was talking about the 1986 case, the voting rights case on race, where they found three necessary preconditions. I say there are four for exclusionary gerrymanders. Here are, here's the pre prevalence of exclusionary gerrymanders. They're not very prevalent. It's hard in a competitive situation, unless you want to take a great risk, to create an exclusionary gerrymander. In the United States, post-2010, there are only two. And how do, how do we know this? We have created 10,000 uh, maps for each of the 38 states with three more congressional districts. And we said, what's the average, well, what's the standard deviation in these maps? Of, of the vote percentages. And we look at that in our uh, hypothetical maps, much like Professor Mattingly's <coughs> maps, and then we compare that standard deviation to what these standard deviations look like in, uh, as observed in the districts as drawn. Two states, Maryland, the state that is being litigated, and Utah are the only two states that have reduce the standard deviation beyond expectations. So there are only two states that tried to, and one state that successfully did, create an exclusionary gerrymander by this standard, and that's Maryland. Utah tried to, but if we went back to my four conditions, uh, it failed because after the fact we found out that uh, Matheson won one of those districts in uh, Utah, despite the effort to uh, redraw him out of his preceding district, he was an incumbent Democrat, uh, and Mia Love lost in the most recent round. But in Maryland, uh, we could take a look at what's expected in terms of seats won or districts carried in my case, uh, and what's observed, and we see that in every election that I've possibly looked at, these are statewide elections where we count up how many districts the statewide candidate won, uh, the observed number of wins of Democrats far outpaces the expected number of wins. Republicans are being excluded here. I mean, look, here are a set of entrenchment necessary conditions. Here there are five. It's a little more complicated than exclusion. And take a look at the expected bias against Democrats or Republicans, and the observed bias against Democrats and Republicans, you'll see that the most biased state in this expectation of creating an entrenchment gerrymander is North Carolina. The most is North Carolina. But all the other suspects are there, too. Uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania and Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, Virginia. Illinois is an interesting case because by nature, because of Chicago principally, uh, there's a lot of built-in bias in Illinois simply due to residential patterns. And if you read the newspapers, you find out that many people, uh, I have like six different sites to people saying Illinois is a pro-democratic pro gerrymander. The fact is, what really happened in Illinois is that the Democratic state, uh, 
state legislature reduced some of the built-in bias due to residential patterns, but it didn't overcome it and it didn't create anything favorable to the Democratic Party. The bias still runs against the Democratic Party in, in that state, and uh, that's not a gerrymander in the sense of the manipulation of the lines, which was true, the lines were manipulated, but in Illinois, that case over there on the left, uh, you can see that it's still biased against the Democrats. So you have to be wary. If you want a partisan blind map drawing process, you would forbid Illinois Democrats from reducing some of nature's unnatural bias against the Democrats in Illinois if you just go for partisan blindness. You have to pay attention to what Emma Bondurant was saying at the last session. It has to be a manipulation that creates discrimination, not just a manipulation that takes into account partisan partisanship when drawing the lines. Illinois took into account partisanship when drawing the lines, but it didn't do so to produce anything that was a discriminatory outcome. <coughs> Quickly, to show you the entrenchment, am I going oh, over? I'll get this done in another minute and a half. Here's a look at the entrenchment uh, through 24 different elections analyzed, statewide elections where we look at districts carried. And with 45% of the vote, uh, a, a Democrat could expect to win, or Democrats could expect to win three seats in North Carolina. And with 50% of the vote, the Democrats could expect, or did win three uh, seats with 50% of the vote. With 54% of the vote, they won three seats. With 55% of the vote, they won three or four seats. The Republicans clearly have entrenched their position in the congressional delegation in uh, North Carolina. And we could see from back here that it would take about 56, it would take about 56% of the vote for the Democrats in North Carolina to be expected to win half the seats. We can tell that going in, and we can see in the analysis later that that's indeed what happened. So my pitch is that we could take two simple statistics, the standard deviation and the skewness of the distribution, and looking at those two, we could say, as map makers, <coughs> don't create any standard deviation that's smaller than you could normally expect, using Professor Mattingly's maps, and don't create any bias that would be greater than normally expected, using Professor Mattingly's maps, or other maps. I mean, there are about 20 people uh, generating these sorts of uh, algorithms. So we need a standard just for the map makers, not just for the courts. Thanks. All right, so next we have uh, John Curry and uh, Tyler Steelman uh, from the other blue down the road. <laughs> So not to alert everyone, um, but another accident has occurred alongside Bathroom Gate 2019. My pen has exploded in my hand, so if we have shaken hands, I would encourage you to check them. Uh, on the off chance, uh, my first victim. <laughs> So I'd like to welcome everyone today. Um, I'll be presenting this work um, on behalf of myself and John Curiel. Uh, we took third place in the competition this year. Um, and we're going to be talking a little bit about um, district design, and specifically zip codes, and their relationship to representation in the United States. And so you've heard uh, several people today talk about the implications of the court case uh, last year and court cases in prior years. The court seems hesitant to get involved in this issue, particularly as it relates to uh, judging electoral outcomes. 
um, and talking about standing and who has the right to bring these cases up, John and I started thinking about this problem and asked the question, can we find a standard of harm that can be demonstrated in district design and how districts are drawn specifically? And so as we started that, we started thinking about what's unique about district-based representation? What makes that so special? And part of that is the relationship that's fostered and created between constituents and a single representative. And this relationship is so unique and important because it allows these two groups, legislators and constituents, the ability to know one another, to intimately know one another, and to communicate with one another. And so we were thinking about this, and we were saying, is there a contemporary unit that sort of approximates the intent behind district-based representation where we could look for this relationship and help further it? And so we found that in zip codes. And so zip codes were created in the 60s to maximize mail efficiency. Uh, they were designed so that the geographic center of the zip code was the postal, uh, the post office, and the boundaries were drawn around existing postal delivery routes that had been created through local petitions uh, throughout American history. And to this day, the Postal Service holds uh, the patent on the use of zip codes and their design. And for the most part, zip codes are pretty static uh, in their shape, but occasionally they do change. And when they do change, it's the result of the Postal Service taking into account new housing developments. Uh, it's communities coming together and saying, this zip code doesn't reflect who we are. And we would like to see the boundary change. Um, and occasionally, members of Congress will recommend boundary changes, usually around those same concerns constituents are bringing up. This zip code should be in my district. This boundary should go over here just a little bit. And so zip codes themselves, um, their population is constrained. The median zip code is about 3,300 individuals. They're fairly small. And you can see here, the population um, is heavily skewed towards the bottom of that chart, indicating that most zip codes are fairly small in their population. Um, and it's done so that, so that these units can be functionally compact, and it's in service of maximizing efficient mail delivery for the postal service. And so they play a key role in communication in the United States. And since their inception, they have remained as such. And so what can zip codes provide as a mediator in representation between constituents and their members. Well, more generally, uh, mail is the only means by which you can reach out to a geographic constituency. So whether that geographic constituency is a congressional district or uh, perhaps a water and soil district, um, mail is often matched and is matched uh, by a resident zip code. And so you've seen the mail. You've gotten it says, uh, to this person or resident of. And so that's what's happening there. They're, they're assigning you that mail based on your zip code. And so for members, this is important because representatives, uh, particularly in Congress, are um, only allowed to frank to people in their district. They're not allowed to frank to someone else's constituents. And so when they're sending out this mail uh, and they're trying to canvas their entire geographic constituency, zip codes play a key role in that. And we can see here on the electoral side that direct mail, which is this uh, largest bar here, is still the most common method by which um, candidates communicate with their geographic constituency. And this is from data from 2014. And it's also important uh, to note the relevance of zip codes for constituents. Um, has anyone ever been onto congress.gov? Anyone ever been? So if you uh, go to the top right hand corner and search your member, the first thing they ask you for is a zip code. And so let's take this into a real world example. For anyone from Durham, uh, this is zip code 27713, uh, with this star approximating South Point Mall. And so this zip code here, which is this darkest boundary, uh, is actually in four separate congressional districts. And so this is a common problem that we saw in our research. If you'll notice here and here, this narrow corridor connects the two largest parts of North Carolina's fourth congressional district. And so in our research, we found that this problem affects about 20% of zip codes. Um, and the number of people who live in those 20% uh, amounts to about 100 million Americans live in a zip code split by multiple congressional districts. So what would happen if you lived in 27713, went onto congress.gov, and input your zip code? You'd be given a list of your possible representatives. And alongside this, they do give you the opportunity 
to input your actual address, which you would hope people would just put their address in, right? Well, our research shows that that's not the case. So here, this is uh, Sheila Jackson Lee's website, congressional website, where she explicitly states that the zip code that you get from is split between multiple congressional districts, and if you send me mail, and you live in one of the other districts that that zip code is a part of, I will just throw your mail out. Now, she tries to make it sound like a courtesy. Um, she says, out of courtesy to the other members, I would hate to read their mail. So I'll just throw it out for you. <laughs> and so we left with all of this information and thinking about the relationship between zip codes and representation as it pertains to gerrymandering, and we developed some hypotheses that we thought captured um, our expectations. And so we believe that individuals, constituents, who live in zip codes that are split between multiple congressional districts would be, as a result of this confusion that I just showed you, less likely to recall the name of their member, would be less likely to contact that member, and would be more likely to perceive alienation from their member of Congress. And so, lucky for us, the CCS, which is a, a common survey used in political science, over the last 10 years asked some of these questions. And they also, um, alongside individual responses, gave us their zip codes. So we were able to say, what are, what's happening then to people who live in these split zip codes? And so the CCS asked whether you recall your member, whether you contacted your member. And they also asked individuals to place themselves on a seven point ideological scale, from most conservative to most liberal. And they asked each individual to rate where their member of Congress was on that same scale. So we're able to get a sense of the distance that these individuals perceive between themselves and their own member. And so in thinking about zip codes, in our analysis, we included two measures of zip code violation. So first, uh, we asked just simply the question, what is the number of congressional districts inside of each zip code? And then secondly, we measured the population overlap between a zip code and its largest congressional district. So we could see about, you know, even if something is split between two congressional districts, if one congressional district takes up 90% of the population, we would expect that to have less of an impact than a zip code that is shared equally, let's say, between three congressional districts. And then consistent with social science gobbledygook, we include some other stuff. And it brings us to this. And so what I want you to take away from this, this is our uh, model of recall. What I want you to take away is if you'll notice on the left side of each of these panels, this is the predicted recall for someone who lives in a split zip code and also lives in a zip code that doesn't share a lot of population with its largest congressional district. And in each of our models, we found that for an individual that lives in a zip code split by multiple congressional districts, that their level of recall of their member is significantly less than that than we would see from a district or a zip code with only one congressional district. So our first hypothesis was correct. And we followed this up with uh, contact. And again, if you'll notice on the left side here, for each of these scenarios of various level, of various numbers of congressional districts splitting a zip code, we again see about a 20 point reduction in the likelihood that an individual is contacting their member of Congress when they live in a split zip code. Again, confirming our expectation. And this is a graphical representation of our model of ideological distance. So, for an individual that lives in a zip code only split by two congressional districts, there's not a lot of perceived difference between them and their member. And I would like to point out here that we're controlling for individuals who are of the same race and party as their member. And so these are people that should perceive a, 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 a fair amount of ideological similarity with their member. But as we move across here to more, zip, to more congressional districts inside of a single zip code, we see a great deal of alienation. The people are perceiving their member of Congress is not much like them. And we attribute this to zip codes being split between multiple congressional districts. And so what does this suggest? We think that zip codes play a vital role in the representative constituent link, or the constituent uh, representative link. People don't know their member, they don't contact their member, they perceive greater alienation from their member. And we believe this amounts to individual representational harm. Uh, and then we asked the question, could we actually implement this? Could we redistrict in a state and preserve every single zip code while also preserving things like the Voting Rights Act and equal population? And so here is the outcome of that. 
Here are the maps used in 2013 to elect members of Congress for North Carolina. These are the maps that were actually used. And here, based on that map, is our method where we were able to preserve every single zip code in North Carolina. And I would point out that not only were we able to preserve every zip code in North Carolina, but our maps are far more equitable for both parties. In our maps, you see four solid Dem seats, five solid GOP seats, and then uh, three or four that are toss up or just in. And then if you compare our method using the efficiency gap, here is the bias for the map used in the 113th Congress. And in all of our simulations, we were unable to produce a map as biased. <laughs> so conclusions, uh, preserving zip codes improves representation. People are better able to know who their member is. They're, they're more likely to contact them, and they perceive less alienation between themselves and their member. And this is possible in keeping uh, the tradition of other uh, statutes and, and rules given to us about gerrymandering, and that we can do this and maintain equal population in the VRA. And also, it constrains partisan outcomes. And so, uh, we conclude where we sort of create this judicial standard where, very simply, we say, when you redistrict, don't split zip codes. And if you have to, do it in such a way that allows people the opportunity to know their member, to recall, their name to contact them and proceed less alienation. And that is all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll take questions in just a second, but it's just to stall while you think of your questions for a second. I'll just point out that. Now, at first I was a little offended that someone from Chapel Hill decided to take uh, South Point Mall as the representative point in Durham. Um, but then I got over it because you came so prepared that you actually brought the Federalist Papers. So, so I think we're ready for anything. So are, are there any questions out there? So, and, and if I could just ask, please try to keep them short so that we have some time to have lots of questions and uh, move it around, please. Um, I'm Andrew Silver from Durham. Uh, if the North Carolina Constitution has a clause to Fair and equal elections. Uh, I can understand fair elections. I don't understand what equal elections would mean, or is that the exact terminology? First, let me ask you a question. Did people in the back hear the question? No. All right, so I'm going to have to <laughs> try my memory. All right, so I think the question was, he understood in the North Carolina Constitution what a fair election was, but it says fair and equal elections, and the question is, what is equal? Does anyone want to play lawyer, constitutional? Yeah, so um, we're... We're working, my staff and I are working on trying to figure out what these clauses mean. And that's an interesting phrase because phrasing about equal elections occurs in, as I think I said during my presentation, I believe 28 different state constitutions. So it is difficult to know, to discern exactly what that sort of thing means, but it often is construed to mean things like voters should have equal opportunity to elect representatives of their choice. And there's a gap. I was just talking with Allison Riggs in the other question period in the other panel. And she said that one of the difficulties with using that is that whoever writes that opinion, let's say in the North Carolina Supreme Court, um, whoever writes that opinion is going to have to do a lot of work to figure out what that means. This is, the, this is the meat of constitutional law, is to take a phrase like that and figure out what it means. The other phrases, it's easier. That phrase, there's work to do. So there's lifting involved. And, I, and I, I'd be happy to correspond with you further, because my staff and I have like, dozens of cases where people have done this kind of thing. Anyone else? All right. Go ahead. Um, Can you stand up? Okay. Several of, of your results um, depend on, I think, sort of simulating lots of different maps that might be possible and then doing statistics across those, those maps. What, what is a random map? What does that mean? How do you generate random maps? Uh, no. Um, so, you, you really want me to, okay, I'll answer it in one sense. Uh, the short answer is come to, I guess, the one of the panels tomorrow, um, when I'll talk a little bit about that. The, the answer is you come up with some criteria that you think are nonpartisan, right? And should, we should say non, random nonpartisan maps, and then you go through an algorithm that tries to generate a representative sample of nonpartisan maps based on that criteria. So the long right. answer is tomorrow. Is that... uh, yeah, the long, I probably won't have too much longer. But, uh, but that's a short sure, answer. And people can put different criteria. 
And that's a question, right? I mean, when you look across all these states, if you, we found that if you include preserving municipalities, if you include voting rights acts, if you include different things, you may get different answers. But what's interesting is that when people generate maps by lots of different methods, in some of these cases, especially the ones that are more, you know, extremal cases, as, as Emmett was talking about um, just a little while ago, it doesn't really seem to matter. The conclusions are the same. All right. Another question? Please. I'm sorry, I have a question stand, stand up, just so. Um, so I have a question specifically for the last presenter. Um, I was just curious um, about how the relationship between zip codes and other political subdivisions would play out um, in making zip codes an actual criteria. Um, for example, zip codes that are in multiple municipalities, um, like 27707 is in Durham, but it's also in Chapel Hill. Um, so how, I'm, I'm just curious if the relationship between zip code um, was stronger than we have the alienation feeling of being split um, apart from your, say, town or city or even county, which is safe. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so let's repeat the question first. I think the question, if I can just condense it to one, to one thing, was just, is the significance of splitting zip codes more than the significance of splitting other, uh, let other municipal or other political you know, boundaries? Yes, and well, second part, how could you comport that criteria, um, a criteria where you can't split zip codes with um, states like North Carolina that value the county as a unit, where a zip code stands for county So to the first part, so first of all, like, so our methods that we employed, they were, we did not develop them first. There's actually been a lot of research into this idea of the confusion hypothesis, where the previous measures were like, how often is a county split? How often are townships split? Turns out there's no effect whatsoever. Same with also compactness, just doesn't matter. There's no observable effect. So, the, and we basically follow the exact same methods as, uh, let's see, it was Bowen 2013, he wrote a very similar article. Yeah, there's no effects for any of that. Uh, as for how zip codes would relate to counties, luckily, zip codes primarily do follow county lines. But that said, in regard to the idea of preserving counties, it turns out counties almost always have to be split. Like, there's no way to actually draw an equally populated map by preserving counties. There is some discretion for state legislative maps where you're allowed some increased, you know, uh, deviation of population, but you're still going to have to split them. So, the good thing about the zip code standard is it does not replace any other standard. Rather, if you were to try to preserve counties, you can go, okay, we have to split this county. How should we split it? Should we just do it like willy-nilly, willy create all these corridors? Like, no, follow zip codes. So it acts as a great way to then supplement all your standards. Stand one stats. I just want to interject here that what Stand is. So I think one issue that may come up with zip codes is that if a zip code is ethnically homogenous or in some other way homogenous, it's still possible to pack voters. So for instance, let's say that you have a zip code that's 80% African American. You could commit a racial gerrymander while preserving the zip code. So I think that the, uh, uh, Curiel's answer that it would be in conjunction with other standards would be a pretty important caveat as to how one could, I mean, it's an impressive standard, but one would want to think about it in terms of other things like racial equity and other communities of interest. And so that, that, that's a thing that needs to be kept in mind. Can I like, follow up with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I agree. So basically, like, yeah, this is not meant to replace any standards. It's rather meant to complement. So we view gerrymandering as a two-stage process. The constituent representative link is violated in order to achieve partisan gain. So if you then use these two in combination, you can then get a pretty good idea of a fair map. Right. Let me go to the back. Yes, sir? No, I'm listening to all of you uh, talk about the criteria that you're using. I guess I'm picking up this more from an artificial intelligence model. You have multiple characteristics that can define what your outcome is. You have multiple characteristics going in your zip code, county, whatever. And then it becomes just a multi dimensional space, right? multiple parameters. And then I'm just either iterating to the minimum or maximum, or right? to minimize the bad or to maximize the good. And then the question becomes, does minimization of the bad actually equal minimization, I mean maximization of the good? Anyone look at that area of research? Because then I can essentially, if you can define what is a good, you know, for redistricting or redistricting plan, uh, then I can try many, many criteria to make sure that that is automatically. Do you want to expect to have you experience? So that, again, that's not fair. I'm supposed to be moderating. Um, I had my moderator hat on. I guess my answer would quite simply be that um, 
I don't think that this system is set up to pick the best map. It's meant to pick among the good maps. Right. And so, so I, I don't know if it's really a, an optimization problem, strictly speaking, where we want to pick the best. But I, I understand what you're saying is that. Um, in, Right. So I think I think what the path that most people have taken is to define what 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 unbiased is, what kind of neutral criteria are, and we can define that compactness, split the population equally, don't split municipalities, try to satisfy the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Does it matter of logic that the simply defining what's good to be what's not bad would suffice? But uh, with regard to the first question. Um, I think that wasn't entirely answered. That the uh, presentation from Bingham uh, contained a really interesting legal citation, which was that uh, a, a majority party that is consistently receiving only a minority of, of, uh, of seats is a, is a bad is, is a situation to avoid. And, and, and I think that's a, a good starting point for what's a fair election outcome. Thank you very much for the comment. Are there any questions? Any other questions? Yes. Sorry. I want to. My question is directed at Dr. Wong. Um, when you show that grid up there of you know each district and their their outcomes of the three Democratic districts in the state of North Carolina, the nine uh, or the I think it's ten Republican districts in the state of North Carolina. It makes it look like these are completely unfair maps. All the Republicans are just cracking these Democratic districts. When in reality, in a southern state like North Carolina, it's meant, most, a lot of the Democrats are disproportionately African American, and two of our districts in North Carolina are meant to create VRA districts, specifically Alma Adams District and G.K. Butterfield's district. That naturally makes these districts disproportionately Democrat, because black voters tend to vote Democratic. So this creates every other district, you have all these Republican voters that are unaccounted for, thus creating a state where the majority of the seats are Republican. How do you counter the balance of making majority-minority districts with having fair, competitive elections? A common defense of a partisan practice is to claim that the drawing of that map is necessitated to empower African-American voters or other minority voters, and that's the argument you just made. I would say here, that there are multiple routes of evidence that suggest that that is not the case. And I think we will hear more about that from Professor Madigan. Generally speaking, it is not the case. <laughs> let, me, let me finish my answer, because like this, this, this particular point gets my dander ever so slightly up. It is generally understood, and since I'm not a lawyer, I'm going to filter it through my own mathy kind of views. The, a current interpretation of voting rights law under the Voting Rights Act is that it is not necessary to build a majority minority district where half the people in the district are black folks or whatever minority might be living in that domain. It's not necessary to do that to give them the ability to elect members of their choosing. So for instance, if you look at the Bethune Hill case, which is a current case that has uh, been dealt with, with by a lower court, it's coming before the Supreme Court in mid-March. Um, there's a thing called conjoined polarization, where if you live in a community where there's a particular minority group, if there's enough uh, white voters who partially overlap in their views with that minority group, then that group still has the opportunity to elect members of its choice. And what that means is that actually it's in compliance with the voting rights law to build a district that's 40% African American or 43% African American because they have a say in the primary. It's, as a matter of plain fact, it's false that it is necessary by geography to build so few districts that favor Democrats. That's just simply a false statement. And the most obvious refutation of that is that from 2010 to 2012, North Carolina went from 8-5, I believe, in one direction, to 10-3 in the other direction. And so your assertion that it's necessary as a matter of geography is false. Okay, all right. Why don't we have that conversation offline after sorry. someone else has a chance to speak? No, that's fine. It's good. No, it's good. Just uh, trying to make sure lots of people have a chance to ask their questions. I'm just waiting. To, I see you too. I'm just seeing if there's anyone in the back wants to raise their hand. I'm trying to geographically distribute my questions. <laughs> Not oversample the front. All right, go ahead. I think you had your hand up for a while, sir, and then I'll come back over here. Yes, I'm Bob Steer from Maryland. I just wanted to observe that uh, in all the stuff that I've looked at, it's not really necessary to subdivide zip code tabulation areas very much. And here's just a couple statistics to throw out to make that point. 
There's an average of 709,000 people in every congressional district in the United States. Pretty much the, oh, from state to state, a lot, of, a lot of states have CDs that vary by about 5%, roughly, from one to another in total population size, and they get away with that. Well, to have a, if you put together a, a, a congressional district, all uniform, all complete ZCTAs, and you were left with one, and you had to, now what do you do with this last one zip code tabulation? <laughs> There's about 32,000 zip code tabulation areas in the United States. There's only 129 of them that exceed 710,000, which is 10% of the 709. And in order to get it to split perfectly, you'd have to have the right down the middle, right? So half of the district would have to be 5% or more. There's only 129 of those. The chances that we will absolutely have to split a district is kind of small. A split a ZCTA in order to achieve complete ZCTAs for all of the congressional districts. It's possible, but it's not likely. And if it is, it'd be very rare. So, thank you. Sorry. Uh, so my question is for the zip code team. Uh, I was wondering, so your statistical model was predicting people's uh, voters recall for their member of, uh, of Congress. And I was wondering what type of statistical controls you used uh, for that. Uh, I can pull them all right here. Oh, great. Uh, Good. Uh, is there any way you can just summarize? I don't, I, I don't think we want a long technical answer. Is there a short, non technical answer? Yeah, so we basically control for typical social demographic uh, controls for the individual respondent. We control for congressional level controls. We then have a random effects by congressional district and state. And we well, might have incumbent. Uh, or how oh, yeah, long we have to, to come see how long congressperson's been okay. there, yeah. uh, what our current majority, just basically everything. It's a pretty long list, and I can show you the table later if you're interested. Okay, I just learned recently it wasn't free, so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah, I have a zip code question. Um, I'm <laughs> aware that some areas have um, a designated zip code that does not correspond to residents, because if you have a post office box, it's a separate designation. So. Your example of 27714 might have 27724 for the post office. So how do you handle those people that don't have the resources? The question was how do you handle zip codes that are designated to post office boxes which are not geographically located, people who use them? I mean, like, ultimately, like, those are few and far between. So ideally, if that were the case, let's see, so... Well, we use residential zip codes. Yeah. So in the voter file, for example, uh, an individual in North Carolina will have both a residential address and a mailing address. And so the zip codes that are requested in the CCS are residential zip codes. So even if someone is receiving mail to another one, we're looking specifically at where they live. More questions? Ma'am, far the back. Can clarify about that? Yeah. Could you stand up? Thank you. I think they're saying that they use the address of where you where, where you have, where you resident, not where you get mail. Residential address has the Chapel Hill zip code, even though it's in Chapel County. So it's not, you know, you're going to get Could I just clarify? I think I think these small questions, technical questions, are maybe best offline. I'd rather okay. keep at the non-technical okay. level for for the conversation here. Please go ahead. Hi, so um, I know that municipalities have uh, often had their boundaries drawn to exclude or include um, minority populations. And I'm wondering if there is any evidence of um, zip code boundaries um, having you know, that kind of gerrymandering drawn into them as well, and whether that would impact um, the drawing of congressional boundaries. So actually, that is something that, something that we are going more into. It's one of the first chapters of the book that we're trying to publish. As for zip codes, they're drawn primarily to maximize functional compactness, and when we ran the test, it turns out, yeah, zip codes maximize functional compactness and minimizing travel times uh, relative to any other type of well, subdivision or physical boundary. As for whether or not it is susceptible to manipulation, I mean, the answer is yes to everything, especially when it comes to race in America. We have a pretty awful history in terms of how that how it compares to, like, let's say, Congress or state legislatures. 
is definitely going to be far superior in the sense that it's an independent agency dedicated to maximizing functional compactness as opposed to trying to exclude voters. So that said, every institution in America is going to have a race problem. That much is certain. But we believe, especially with the results of the grant from the conference, that it's going to be nothing on problem. Everything else, basically. Sir, um, so my question is for Sam. So, in, in early on in your talk, um, you mentioned that uh, that the, the technical details don't matter as much. It's more the question you're asking, and then you had sort of a list of um, for opportunity. You had a list of some tools for outcome. You had a list of some tools. Um, I was just wondering. So, uh, is the statement that I just wanted to sort of, sort of a clarifying question is the statement that it doesn't matter whether you use the efficiency gap or a collection of plans or a mean median or I, I don't remember the thing that was on top. Is mean median and collection plans and one other? Do those tools not matter? Um, do those tools that, in your experience, do those tools ever disagree with one another? And uh, sort of, what's the state of the science, and how much how much more do we need to understand about these tools before we? Yeah, this is a great question. I got worked up because I had to get everything in 15 minutes, and so I, I shorthanded what I meant to say there. Let me just say a little bit more. Um, it's not that they don't matter. Um, I speak as a, like as a science guy. I'm a data scientist. I run a neuroscience research lab. That's actually my day job. And so for me, these mathematical tools don't matter in the sense that all of them work for different things. And it would be a mistake to say, you know what, what I really love is the mean median difference and I'm just going to die on that hill and just go with it. It's more that different kinds of offenses require different kinds of tests. And so, for instance, um, Professor McDonald was a little bit too modest to say that a few years ago he was really working on the mean median difference as a means of testing one of the concepts that he talked about today. The other concept is comparing standard deviations. Well, guess what? If you're in a really partisan state like Maryland or Utah, then you don't want to compare the averages, what you want to do is compare the standard deviations. It turns out there, there's a test for that, and I, and I open up my toolbox and I say, you know, how do you compare standard deviations? Aha, here's the chi-square test. So here's a good test for you. So speaking as a tool user, for me, it's just there's a box of tools there, and, and it's, it's not that it doesn't matter which one you use, it's that you have to know what you're doing, what you're trying to build. And so what I was trying to do is make the point that there are all these tools that, that social scientists and math people have developed to look at different kinds of things. And if the legal question before us is exclusion or inequality of opportunity, the challenge for any expert witness or anybody trying to help out, whether a citizen or a litigator or what have you, is to figure out what the right tool is. So it's not that the tool doesn't matter, it's that the tools map to jobs that judges are trying to get done. And so one would want, and that slide was just a, a list of a few different ones. And so my point was simply that, that one should you know, know what the tool is for before you start hammering on everything. That, that, that was just my point. If I can reinforce Sam's point, <clears throat> I was trying to make the point that you have to, you have to ask, what, what are you pointed at? I'm pointed at, I'm pointing this tool at vote dilution. What aspect of vote dilution? Exclusion or entrenchment? And until you answer that question, you don't know which tool to use. And if you try to apply one, and you, and you're talking about entrenchment, and you, sh but you should be talking about exclusion. Uh, there are people who have applied the entrenchment uh, test to aspects, of the various entrenchment tests, to aspects of the North Carolina, or the Maryland case, and it's really a, an exclusion case. And so when it when these Entrenchment tools don't really apply. You, you leave the court thinking, well, "What the heck? This is gobbledygook." I, I would say probably exclusion cases are usually partisan states where one party is dominant. So yes, right. right. So, so one way to think about it is in dominant states, you're usually worried about exclusion. In competitive states, you're usually worried about manipulation that produces entrenchment. And as Sam said, you have to start with. What's the outcome of interest that you're pointed at, and then find the right tool to uh, identify uh, whether that outcome uh, is uh, really produced. All right, so just we're going to close now with one last question. We'll exercise uh, organizers' prerogative to ask the last question. And if it wasn't clear, I'm not the organizer, so. <laughs> All right, so before I ask my question, I want a show of hands in the room who is not an academic, a social scientist, or a litigator. 
All right, so speed round, super easy question. Yes, that's a lie. If you are not an academic, a social, science or a social scientist or a litigator, tell me in two minutes, no more, what use this presentation has been to me, right? What do I take away from it in two minutes if I'm going back to a grassroots organization? We'll start with Professor McDonald and move this way. I'll repeat what I just said. What you should take away from my presentation is the idea that gerrymandering comes in different forms uh, under different political circumstances and that they're usually pretty easy to identify if you get the right tool and the tools are uh, require two months of statistical training, maybe two weeks we'll do it. Uh, but we're talking about calculating a mean. My granddaughter's nine, she can calculate a mean. A median, usually you have to explain that a little bit, uh, but that takes another 20 minutes. Uh, standard deviation, well, that's when you're gonna take a week. <laughs> All right, thank you. Professor Wong? Um, Broadening out the kinds of things we talk about, uh, speaking as somebody working in this space, it looks a lot to me like the battle against unfair representation has become a state-by-state -state battle. There's still hope at the level of the Supreme Court, but what that means is that you're going to have to work within your state. Here we're in North Carolina, and that means very much, it's very much the case that it has to be fought out in some kind of local level. We hope for relief from the U.S. Supreme Court, but that's going to mean that a lot of the concepts that we're talking about here are probably going to next go to the North Carolina State Supreme Court. And what it means is that your activist energy should probably take whatever you've learned from us, whatever we talk about at this conference, and direct it within the state, as I'm sure many of you have. Like the, the Moral Mondays movement is nationally known for things that you all have done in North Carolina. And so applying that kind of energy next to the State Supreme Court, where you made critical gains this year by having a Supreme Court that is more sympathetic to individual rights, more specific sympathetic to voter rights, that's very important. Another thing is that I think that people in the data space are creating tools that we hope will be useful, either through a little bit of elbow grease, learning st some basic statistics, in the case of my team, developing map-based tools so you can give your community of interest to redistrictors. That's going to come up with the Supreme Court. It's going to come up with the legislature when it does redistricting again in 2021. I think citizen input is very much the wave of the future in finding ways for citizens to talk back to legislators and to give maps using data, and it's going to involve the kind of analytics you've heard about today, it's going to involve automated map drawing software, that's kind of, our, that's kind of the domain of experts in the, in the field, but it's also going to involve you talking about your communities of interest. And so it's a time for people to talk back to their legislators using tools that data people give them. And so I think that's an important thing to think about going forward. And it can be zip codes, it can be map drawing, there are a lot of tools, and the idea is to use those tools to talk to the courts and to talk to your legislators. Great, thank you. And team zip code or Tyler and John? <laughs> so we would say that with our uh, measure of zip codes, we can measure to the extent to which the very purpose of a district is violated. So originally districts were passed, single member districts, so that the majority should govern but the minority heard. When zip codes are violated, and also we then have these unfair outcomes, the majority doesn't govern, and the majority is also not heard, and also the minority also is probably not heard either. So independent of outcomes, so without knowing the outcome in advance, and trying to litigate it after the fact, we can take this and produce outcomes, or we can produce maps and districts, so that constituents can communicate with representatives. Regardless of whether or not you get the candidates of your first choice, you can still then communicate with them. And even though you're of different parties, you can still be part of the same community. And when these codes are violated, that link is broken. Now we have both a system where we don't have proportional representation, and we don't even have a system where the purpose of districts is upheld. We have the worst of all worlds and the strengths of neither. And with this, you can then take this and then use it in your act activist efforts. Specifically, if you're in Canvas, for example, in a place that had fully preserved zip codes, just follow postal routes, a quick and easy way to then canvas the entire district. If zip codes are split, well, I canvassed in the past. It's really hard and irritating. <laughs> Great, thank you. And I have, Professor Mattingly said he would actually answer this question, so I'm going to turn the mic over to him. <laughs> no good deeds unpunished. Um, so I, I think maybe at the highest level, what, what we've heard in a way here is that um, 
it's important to, to, to not be overly reductive in the sense that we have a system, whether it's fair or not, whether it's perfect or not, whether it encapsulates what's representative or not, is it one conversation. But we're also having a conversation about whether we're implementing that system in a way that was not done explicitly to disadvantage groups. And we kind of have to separate those two things. You know, I, I grew up in North Carolina, it might just be that the parts of the state don't get a stronger voice just because where they are geographically and how the people are distributed. That was the point somebody was trying to make. That's just a problem with our system. We can talk about that, but I think when we talk about gerrymandering, we're, we're talking about trying to understand that there is some way to look and say, well, okay, did we follow the rules of the system in an unbiased way at least, and produce unbiased results within that game? So, you know, it's not just did 55% of, of people vote for one party and did they get 55% of the representatives? It's not that simple, and what this group is trying to do is trying to find flashlights to shine on that more subtle question that can be digested by the courts. So. All right, and with that, I will ask for one big round of applause for our <laughs>